Psych Sessions is proud to be supported by Macmillan Learning Psychology. In the classroom, whether in person or on screen, content matters. But not if students are disinterested or disengaged. At Macmillan Learning Psychology, their authors are committed to educators who know firsthand what teachers are facing today. That experience guides not only the books they write, but the interactive learning and assessment tools they help create. No matter how you teach, they can help you captivate your students. Macmillan Learning Psychology. Content matters. Active learning inspires. Learn more at MacmillanLearning.com. Hello, and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Eric Landrum, along with Garth Neufeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 111, where Garth had the opportunity to interview Linda Nilsson from the Office of Teaching Effectiveness and Innovation, Director Emerita, at Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. Before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some listening tips and my favorite moments. Now, when you listen to this interview, it's really interesting to listen to Linda because her comments and her stature and her confidence reflect a career of experience and expertise. And you can just tell in the way that she carries her, herself and kind of her mannerisms and some of for lack of a better word, I guess I would say catchphrases. Um, it was just a real joy to listen to, not only the messaging, but also the way the message was delivered. It was delightful. I don't think I've ever heard someone talk about be, not only being ambitious in first grade, but knowing that they were ambitious in first grade in the context of what a first grader could be ambitious about. Linda invented study habits for herself because she was driven. And these study habits not only were successful for herself, but they laid the basis for things that she was going to explore as a teacher and a scholar later on in her, in her career and very often write about in book form and journal article form and make presentations and workshops in throughout her career. So it was really just fascinating to hear her talk about things. And then at the very end, you kind of get a summary and, you know, Garth asks her about, well, what other books do you have in addition to specifications grading? And you kind of get this, um, her, her writing career was really a way to resolve student challenges and teaching challenges for helping students become better learners. I love this line from from Linda when she's talking about becoming a clearer writer and the process that she went through. She was talking about clarity when she said, you're not impressing anybody by confusing them. There's just so much goodness there. It was really fascinating to talk about Linda's academic history. She started her undergraduate career at UC Berkeley in the late 1960s into the early 1970s as a sociology major, and that's her training with her PhD at UW-Madison. And I think as you listen to her, you get this real sense, I don't know if they would have called it social justice then, but really this sense of helping people in the most earnest possible way, and that is of being a teacher. And she talks about being driven as a teacher from a very young age, really starting to learn to teach and having that passion, I believe, at age 19, and finding herself having a calling for teaching. So it's really just fun to listen to Garth and Linda have this conversation. And then somewhere about close to around halfway through the through their talk together, they talk, start talking about specifications grading, a book that Linda published with uh, Stylus Publishing in Sterling, Virginia in 2014. Now, before they had this conversation, not only had I read specifications grading or spec grading, as she calls it, I'd actually used it in an honors course, I want to say 2016 and 2017. So it was actually lovely to hear the person who kind of invented this this technique kind of chat about it and give live examples and answer Garth's good questions about it. 
what was what's interesting about spec grading and what I loved about their conversation is that it really forces the instructor to think about the details of their expectations and that the front end design of the assignments and the design of the desired outcomes is where the heavy lifting happens before assignments are given. And once you do that, then in theory, things are pretty straightforward after the fact. Almost think about it as a one level rubric with a pass fail level, but not normally as a pass of 70% as we might think of, but it with a higher level. And it's more complicated than that. And really to get the nuances, Garth and Linda have the time and the conversation to get into that. I think you're really gonna enjoy that. I really enjoyed the conversation also too uh, that they had about the point systems that folks use, including myself, especially when we fall into this trap of partial points. And I'm not so sure I've really thought about it in this way, and that's the lovely, lovely gift of this podcast is that it challenges folks, whether you're early, middle, or late in your career, to think about your practice, think about your craft. You know, what messaging does partial points send? You know, can a student do partial points throughout an entire semester in a course, never really conquering anything completely and still earn an A? You know, if you think about that theoretically and conceptually, should there be some basic level of competency to pass a class? Or could you do everything partially and pass? And so specs grading actually sets boundaries, if you will, thresholds that must be satisfied in order for a student to pass. Anyway, I really enjoyed the conversation and I so appreciate Garth arranging it. Please enjoy this interview. Welcome to the podcast. This is Garth and I am so excited today to be joined by Linda Nilsson. Linda, it's Really nice to have you here. If you are not aware of Linda's work, um, she is uh, she spent a career, uh, the better part of a career anyway, at Clemson University and is director emeritus there. Um, and maybe you could correct anything I just said or, or tell us a little bit about what you did there at Clemson. Yes, because my status is, is a very odd one. Uh, when I was there, I was half faculty, half administrative, go figure. Um, so yeah. I was both, I was both, I was neither fish nor fowl, but I both swam and flew. Okay. So, so that's what I was doing. So, uh, the, uh, provost really liked my work, really liked all my publications and everything and wanted to give me emeritus status as sort of like a reward, but uh, I wanted it because I wanted to keep my email. I wanted to keep my computer support. I wanted to keep my library privileges. And so he was kind enough to just make it happen. So that's how I got the emeritus status, director emeritus of the Office of Teaching Effectiveness and Innovation. Now, there is a, a, a director there now who is doing, well, what I was doing, but her job is different somewhat different from mine. But in any case, uh, I got the emeritus status and I'm very, very happy about it. Fantastic. Well, thanks for that. And, and um, how, how many years did you spend at Clemson? 18 years, all told. 18 years. So hold on, let's work backwards here. 18 years. And where uh, were you before that? Okay, five and a half years at Vanderbilt University as director of the Center for Teaching. And then before that, I was at the University of California, Riverside, where I was uh, director of the Teaching Assistant Development Program, but I also was working with faculty because they had nowhere else to go. So they came to me and that was fine. I got that experience. I was very happy about that. Uh, and then before that, uh, I was at uh, UCLA as a faculty member, uh, a professor in the sociology department. So that's your, ba if we go back far enough, that's your background is sociology. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and let's just let's just keep going uh, backward in in uh, uh, for a few minutes here. Let me start the other way, which is uh, where did you grow up? 
I grew up in Chicago. I was raised there. I despised the weather. And so as soon as I could, which was when I went off to college, I got out of the place. And I went to the University of California, Berkeley as an out-of-state student. And because that's where the action was at the time in my generation. And I had a fabulous time. But I also uh, did very well there uh, because I knew how to study and a lot of people did not. So fine. So I did well. Uh, And then I went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison back to the cold climate because I wanted to be a burrowing animal and just (laughs) study all the time. Now that, and it turned out, I, you know, I mean, I burrowed quite a bit. I really did. But uh, I also had a wonderful time there. So, um, Anyway, but I did, so, I got out of there in uh, with a PhD in four years and three months. And I was really happy about that because, you, you, know, you know, you get sick of school after a while. Well, I have this feeling that you were, have always been pretty ambitious, um, which, yeah. uh, and I wonder how, how far that goes back, but oh, um, no, that, that sounds could- like it's been with me for a while. That, that, well, I remember being ambitious in first grade, but it was a different kind of game back then. But yeah, I wanted to get straight A's. As soon as I found out, oh, I can get A's around here, then I wanted to get them all the time. And all of them in in all subjects except physical education. <laughs> well, I was, well, I was lucky to get a B, okay? You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've got to tell you, when... When I read, I, I've I've not seen you speak, but I did hear uh, about you from a, a colleague um, who has seen you speak and uh, said and has read your your books, uh, multiple um, books that you've written actually, and said, oh, um, well, in fact, the the book that we're going to talk a little bit about today is specifications grading, but I'll just tell you how this happened was. Um, I have heard this uh, specifications grading a little bit over the years. And then all of a sudden, within a month, I had like three conversations with people and I just started picking it up everywhere. And I thought to myself, and this is how it often goes for me. uh, It occurs to me, I'm probably slow. uh, So something in the universe is speaking to me over over years, but uh, finally starts to hit me over the head. And so I reached out to you about this. But what I wanted to say is, after reading this book, uh, I love your voice in this book. I love how confident you are. It is it is so refreshing to me. Uh, you are solving problems for faculty and you're not shy about it. And now that, I am, now that I'm talking to you, I think, of course, this is the woman who wrote this book. It's the woman who uh, came to college and knew how to study um, and did very well there and then did uh, a PhD in four years and a few months. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of how I'm hearing just your voice in person now and then also uh, th- through the book. But let me ask you a couple of questions just yes. because our audience really does like to know our, our, our guests a little bit. Um, talk to me about back in 19 whatever when you're, you go to UC Berkeley. Um, uh-huh. And by the way, was that an under, undergraduate degree in sociology as well? Yes. Yeah, I was okay. I was a straight arrow. Mm hmm. Okay, well, that's fun because, um, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what years you were there, but I'm guessing that was pretty late sixties, uh, nineteen seventy. Okay, yeah. Well, that's what I that's what I was hoping for. Yeah. So that means that there's a lot going on. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> but what did you? Where did you learn how to study? Because you really focused on on, or, or you mentioned that, and I just want to mine that a little bit further. Yes. Well, um, I. I had a uh, Catholic education uh, from years one through eight. And years th- uh, three through eight, I was in a private Catholic girls' school, otherwise known as a convent school. And uh, those nuns were very, very strict. Uh, and of course, and I wanted to get straight A's, right? So I really had to. I really had to do my best. I had to really focus, and and I did. Um, so anyway, they they didn't. We we had a lot of homework from fifth grade on. We had homework before that, but we had a lot of homework then. And I realized that in order to get my straight A's in this environment, that I had to learn how to 
read, uh, like, because we had readings every night. And I had to learn to read and retain. And so I would quiz myself constantly every night. So I, I, whatever I had to read, it, it worked. And now this feeds into another book I wrote about uh, self-regulated learning. And I realized, my Lord, I was a self-regulated learner when I was 10 because I had to be to keep getting my straight A's. So that's where I learned how to study. Uh, I stumbled on the quizzing of myself, uh, and it worked. It worked really well. Uh, so that's uh, really where I learned how to study. And I, I also learned how to write. And the way I learned how to write, and I learned how to write well and clearly at a very young age, is that the nuns made us write every single rotten day for 35 minutes. It was called exercise period. And we were given, we had to write essays every day at age 10. Uh, and of course at 11 and 12 and 13. But in any case, uh, I actually paid attention to the feedback and I learned how to write really, really clearly, really well. Now, graduate school messed that up, right? But I transcended graduate school eventually <laughs> uh, when I learned that, oh, writing's communication. That's right. Uh, oh, I thought I knew that at some point, but I forgot because I thought writing was to, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I, somehow uh, make your legitimacy clear, right? Uh, so I got, but I got beyond that and I went back to communication. So anyway. Well, that's, that's an interesting, that's interesting because I think uh, maybe, and maybe I could ask you in graduate school, uh, it's, it's quite prescriptive how, how we're asked to write uh, for, you know, to be scholarly. Um, it, and is that what you're, is that what you're referring to? So it removed all of your creativity or what your uniqueness out of you? It, it made my writing less clear. It, it, oh, and, interesting. And clarity, it, you know, clarity is everything, right? Um, and you know, directness is everything. Uh, and, and that's what I had to get beyond. And I didn't get beyond it till I was 30, working with a technical writer who was going over my writing for, then this was writing for a lay audience, an educated lay audience of uh, advisors uh, for the state of California on seismic safety. I was in disaster research at the time. And so this was a bunch of recommendations to the Seismic Safety Commission of the state of California. And I had to be really clear and non-academic. So this technical writer went through all my all my texts that I had drafted and actually taught me how to write, that writing was all about clarity. You're not impressing anybody by confusing them. Okay. So that's where I really, really learned to write. Oh, I love that. You're not impressing anybody by confusing them. Uh, I, I, I hope that somebody out there is writing that down right now. <laughs> um, I, I have a feeling that, uh, that because you've been doing what you've been doing for such a long time that uh, I'm going to have to stop from uh, and, and just stop our conversations uh, every once in a while uh, to uh, clarify a little bit for myself uh, of exactly, you know, where or mine those nuggets of wisdom that are that are probably going to come up in this conversation today. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, now, uh, when you get uh, your PhD from uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, go uh -huh. Badgers. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you do you have an idea at that point that you are going to spend a career in teaching and learning and 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 working with faculty, or how did that how did that happen? Uh, I had a burning desire, and I mean burning desire, to teach, to teach sociology. And I realized this when I was 19. And so I just arranged the, the rest of my education and uh, early career to be able to do that. Uh, I wanted, mm, what my goal at the time was to help I wanted to help young people realize that when you know 
what's socializing you. When you know how the society has, you know, pressed your buttons and, you know, your parents have made you into what you are and your your uh, school has and your friends and all these different uh, religion, whatever, all these different effects on you. When you realize that's what's been going on in your life, you can make yourself free. You can pick and choose the influences that you want on you. You can become your own person. So that's what I wanted to share with young people because I finally got that when I was 19. I got it and I had to share it. And did you get that from a, uh, like a faculty, like a teacher or did you, did it just occur to you internally while you were at Berkeley or how, how did that happen? To me- internally when I was at Berkeley. Uh-huh. Yeah. And yeah. and so then you, I mean, you had the light and you wanted to share it with others, it sounds Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Had to. Had to. And I didn't, I'd take an intro to everything and I didn't know what, what I wanted to do with my life, but I knew I wanted to do something, something definite. And I wanted a career. I've never had children. I'm not interested in having children. I never was. Uh, of course, now I've got step grandchildren, but you know, um, <laughs> you, you can't escape other people's decisions, right? So, so uh, I knew I wanted I wanted a substantial career, and academia fit fit well in a lot of different ways. But in particular, the way I could how how I could share this with other people. So at at 19, you know that you want to teach. And so that's what you're gunning for from that point on. Yep. That was it. Okay. And and were you wanting to teach, teach at the college level? Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. And I wanted to teach, I wanted to teach fairly bright students. So I knew I'd have to do research to get the kind of job I wanted. Okay. Um, so you graduate, uh, um, uh, from University of Wisconsin, and then what? Do, what are the job prospects at that point, and and where do you where do okay, you go? Is that when you I, head to uh, California? Yes, UCLA. That was my first job. And it, by the way, I was never a teaching assistant. I had never taught a day in my life until I walked into my classroom for the very first time, and I was twenty five. I was scared, but I knew this was what I was supposed to be doing. See. I was, I'd been called. It was a vocation. It was, you know, I had to. And it all worked out. And as soon as I opened my mouth, I kind of knew what to do. Wow. That's really cool. Uh, did, was there a community uh, or where did you, where did you kind of hone, hone your skill? Did you do that just in, in isolation or were there a group? Because right now, for example, the people who are listening to this podcast, we have this wonderful society called the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a great support group. We're all learning from each other um, um, kind of in, in large ways through, um, you know, whether it's Facebook conversations or conferences or, or working together on task forces or something like that. Uh, what opportunities were there for you to learn how to teach or to do zero? Uh, the, zero. You, uh-huh. you did back then. Okay. We're 1975. You didn't dare talk about teaching to, well, to anybody, to a colleague anyway. Um, it, it, especially not at a research university. That would be the kiss of death. If people knew, if colleagues knew that you were really committed to teaching and really interested in teaching, uh, you weren't going to last long in that field or you weren't going to la- last long at that level. Um, so it was, um, I mean, the, it, and not only that, it was, it was worse than that. The only book that was out there on teaching at that. I, I don't even remember it was published at that year or maybe a little bit later was uh, William McKeechee's or Wilbert McKeechee's teaching tips, probably the first edition. That was it. And yeah, so there, well, was, um, there was no guidance for, as far as you knew, there was lecture and discussion and it seemed like, seemingly nobody knew how to run a discussion. <laughs> a good one. <laughs> well, that's, that's really interesting that that's the book that was out there. Uh, 
we had the opportunity on this podcast to interview Bill before he passed just wow. a couple of years ago in, in, in Michigan. And, um, w- and that book has really stood the test of time for people who are learning how to teach. Yeah. Um, but so that was, that was your support. One yeah, book. that was it. But I, I didn't read that book because I didn't know about it yet. And again, I didn't dare talk about teaching. Now, I talked with one my best friend there. He taught statistics. And we would teach a little we would talk a little bit about teaching. But the way he did it is he would start the start the he had a big statistics class. And he would start he'd do like a Johnny Carson monologue or now I guess it, you know Kimmel or somebody monologue uh and he was just good at thinking up jokes and that would loosen everybody up. It would take the tension out of the room because everybody was stressed about st- statistics. And he, he was a very, he was just interesting to listen to. And he was funny. And so, you know, I, well, he was a nice role model. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that, 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 was, that was the one person who knew I really was there to teach. Oh, that's so, so interesting to hear. You know, there are so many people, I, I think, in the Society for Teaching of Psychology who have felt this calling uh, to teach. Uh, mm-hmm. And, um, but, you know, I was, I was listening to an interview with James Corden, uh, speaking of late night uh, television, I was listening to an interview with him and he said, he said, some actors are just humans doing acting because they, uh, they're like the rest of us. So you can see, and they're good actors. Um, uh, but then there are the aliens who, <laughs> like Meryl <laughs> Streep, who just, who just becomes somebody else. And uh, anyway, I, you know, I, I think uh, uh, that that you're one of these aliens that uh, you really it, it it captured you it trans it transformed you and yeah. so um, and I see that in your work here so let's let's move along I know that you um, have spent years and years um, uh, kind of tra- training faculty supporting faculty. Uh, tell me about what is the best thing about teaching teachers. Oh, uh, first of all, yes, go on. No, I was going to say, I I hate asking questions of, tell me the best thing. Tell me what you loved about it. They were, they were in front of me voluntarily and therefore they were motivated. (laughs) So they were the easiest students in the world. (laughs) And they also, yeah, and they, and, and they had problems and they knew they had problems and they really wanted them solved. And my job was to find out about their problems and help them solve their problems or prevent them from happening to begin with. And I was more than happy to do that. And so I really trained my mind to think along those lines, but I heard faculty talking about their problems in my office for decades. And when I heard a problem often enough, I figure, okay, let's get a solution to this, uh, so, or solutions, um, of perhaps a number of solutions. Here, take your pick, right? You know, whatever fits your personality. And so I would seek those solutions and then I'd design a workshop about that problem. And sometimes workshops would turn into chapters in books or books or something like that so it was always the the listening to faculty first and then workshops and then or presentations of some sort but usually workshops and then uh then writing and i was doing so all it, kinds uh, of before the specifications grading for the book came out i was doing workshops on it for years so i got a lot of bugs out of the system before I actually wrote the book. Right. And I, I was going to ask you if you always had a book in you, but it same, sounds like it didn't quite work that way. It sounds like you gained a bunch of ex- a bunch of experience and then the book came kind of naturally. Yes. yes, the book came naturally. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> my first book, real book, came out in 1998. And that was, you know, I'd, I'd been in the field for, oh, I hate to date myself, but for over 20 years, you know, I've been either teaching or, or doing faculty development for over 20 years at that point. But I finally, finally had something to say. Finally had some way to help faculty. 
Yeah. What was it? Uh, the move to mo- the move from faculty to uh, directing uh, teaching learning centers or working in teaching learning centers. Um, what was that like for you? Because I do know some colleagues who have done that or who are thinking uh-huh. about doing that. Uh, what was uh, what was the considerations or what are, were the considerations that you um, that that were kind of in play? Well, what what you know, my the, my TA training experience and faculty development experience. I mean, it felt really good, really good, and it was also um, a developing field. So I felt that uh, I was getting into something that was, it was almost like getting on, almost onto the ground floor with it. Um, I was, I was early in TA training. That hadn't been going on very long when I got into it either. And um, I just find, found it very refreshing to help faculty learn how to do what somehow I had learned how to do. uh, But of course, more and, and 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 different ways of teaching than what I had learned, um, and and it was it was again it's a, it's legacy it's 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 passing on what you know to other people who can use it. Another thing that was going on, but this was a little bit later, I saw the the job of faculty changing before my eyes and becoming more and more time consuming and more and more difficult and that really motivated me to want to help faculty uh, to help them give take back their lives and to have a life uh, you know yeah, teaching loads increased uh, the, the the students were so heterogeneous you didn't know where to aim uh, that that there were more and more demands but more and more uh, well like service demands, especially university service demands put on you, higher and higher bars for research and for productivity. It just, it was, it was becoming a less pleasant job. And uh, I, you know, I, I can tell you right now that given what it's turned into, I'd never go into uh, become a faculty member now. Faculty development, Sure. Faculty, no. Although you've got to do faculty before you become a faculty developer. I understand that. But the job has changed so radically and it's so, it's so difficult now. That's so helpful to hear. Uh, and so after you did kind of a hybrid thing at, at UC Riverside, then you your first full-time appointment was at Vanderbilt. Is that right? Yes. I uh, first as, full-time as a appointment in faculty development. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you spent, you know, 20, 23, 24, 25 years uh, doing it. And I'll tell you, that's the voice that comes through when I uh, am reading this book. I I think one of the things I, I put books down, if if they don't capture me, I put books down. I'm not one of those people who can plug away at a book that's not really, uh, you know, where I'm at right now. But when I read this book, uh, I thought to myself, here is someone who has heard this for a long time, and uh, now it's making a lot of sense. You have faculty over decades who have come to you with these problems like uh, grade grubbing. Oh, my students are grade grubbing, or, yeah. or they want to argue every point. Um, and so you have come up with solutions, uh, told probably dozens of faculty about the solutions or the suggestions, and eventually that becomes a workshop and now yes. a book. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And by the way, when I was in faculty development, I was usually teaching at some point during the academic year as well. Now, I might have been just teaching graduate students. I might have been teaching undergraduates. But I always sort of, uh, you know, kept my finger in that pie uh, just to get the feel of how students were changing in particular. Uh, I, I, and you, you know, you just have to get to know them, right? And then keep getting to know them as, as, as time goes on. So, so I was experiencing some of those issues myself. Uh, and, you know, I was certainly one of the, I didn't care for grading either. Not, not with this point system. I just, I just didn't care for it at all. Uh, and, you know, and then they, you know, then, then they line up at your office and they're trying to get another half a point out of you. And I, I knew it was going on. I just didn't know how to fix it. Not when I was first experiencing this, but eventually you figure it out. 
you know, over years. But um, it eventually I, I started coming up with with solutions and it turned into specs grading. Well, I love a good title, and this book is uh, the subtitle for Specifications Grading. First of all, talk about clarity. It The title is Specifications Grading, and that's what the book is about, um, yeah. which is great. Um, and the subtitle, uh, if this doesn't grab you, um, I don't know what will. Restoring rigor, motivating students, and saving faculty time. I yeah. mean, I think you just spoke to our hearts right there. Like, that is what we want. We want a rigorous course where students are engaged, where it doesn't kill us. <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. Where where you 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 can have a life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how to approach this. Um, but but let me let me throw some questions out to you, and you we can kind of take it where it goes. But here here's the thing: for people who have not heard of specifications grading before, um, and or maybe they have, but they've also heard about contract grading, and there are some other things that are perhaps related. Can you just uh, quickly, and then we'll dive into it a little more deeply? Um, can you quickly summarize, like, what is specifications grading? Um. Wait a minute, let me just get rid of this disabled. Okay, that, 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 my computer did something, right? And I need to like. Um, yeah, of course. Okay. Of course. Okay. Okay. Uh, now it's behaving again. Um, I, I, I slapped it down. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. First of all, contract grading was something that was going on when I was a student. And so to me, contract rate, and it's also in the literature, was something that you work out with your professor, okay? And so there's this contract, and generally it's the student who initiates the terms of the contract. And then the faculty member can tweak it and do di different things to it. But the problem with contract grading, and the problem persisted, by the way, over the years, was that there were no clear standards set up for the products that students were supposed to produce. And they, you know, they say, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll write a 30 page research paper on, on such and such a topic. And, but, but, you know, what, I, what were the standards of quality? That was never clear. That was never laid out. That was never, you know, what what had to be in there. Uh, and instead it was sort of like, a, I don't know, a, a friendly, touchy-feely sort of arrangement that made it very difficult for the faculty member to, at the last minute, enforce any standards of rigor. And so contract grading justifiably got a bad reputation within the first several years of its existence. And I didn't want that at all. I sort of, what, what specs grading does, it sort of turns it on its head in that it's not really a contract because the, the, the professor is making the terms uh, of uh, the, the, the work that is that must be done to get whatever level of grade. Cause you, as a student with specs grading, you can pick your grade. You say, well, I only need a C. I don't want to do all that work. I don't have the time. I'm not majoring in this. I don't care. No problem. Pick a C. And that'll give you a lot less work to do. And, uh, but everything you do within that bundle of assignments and tests for that C, you have to pass it. Okay. So everything is graded pass fail. All assignments and tests are graded pass fail, but the standards for passing are not 70% or a C minus or any of that nonsense as was true, let's say, in pass fail grading of courses. It has nothing to do with that. This, you generally have to get eight, at least 80% in terms of a test to pass it. And you have to meet certain specifications in the assignment, meet certain specs, like in a computer program, there's specs. So you have to meet the specs in order to pass. And if you're missing any spec at all, uh, that you will, quote, 
fail, that that assignment will fail now, or that essay will fail if you have the specs laid out for that in, in advance, as you should, if you're going to give an essay test, you should have the specs laid out. So the, with specs, students know exactly what they have to do, exactly what they have to put into the work, exactly what elements must be there for them to pass. And if they have any questions, the stakes are stakes are pretty high. Students, re- even, if, even if there are what I call tokens that give them a second chance, the stakes are pretty high. So guess what? They ask questions. They say, well, you know, wh- what do you mean, you know, what do you mean, like, uh, what really is a topic sentence here? What do you mean that there has to be a topic sentence of the essay in the first paragraph? You know, what's a topic sentence? Uh, Like, yeah, maybe they should know, but they don't know because they've never had to know to do well before. One of the problems that we have created for ourselves is partial credit. Mm. We want our students to pass. We want them to do well. So what do we do? Students maybe do, you know, half of an assignment well or half right. And we don't give them 50%, right? We'll pass them. We'll give them 70%, maybe even 75%. Uh, And because we don't want, oh, we're kind of afraid of their ego and this and that and this and that. Well, the problem is we haven't made our standards clear to begin with. So, yeah, we no wonder we're protecting our students because we haven't been laying on the line what we want of them. And this is what the specs are all about. All the, the the hard work of grading is up front. You can do it over the summer, right? But you got to think about what do I, what, what outcomes do I want my students to show me that they have achieved in this piece of work? And there, there it's, that's where you start with your specs. What do you want them to show? What do you want them to demonstrate? Very specifically. Now, for a, you know, a, a, a substantial paper, you might have 10 specs. You might have five specs. You might have maybe 15, but then you're starting to, you know, like people can't keep track of it. But in any case, this is where you really, where the rubber meets the road. What do you want your students to do? And then it's up to you to specify what that is. And you can show the models. You can show them, well, this would be a good essay. And this would not be a good essay. So let's say we assign um, like a, uh, a literature review. Well, what you want to think about is, okay, Okay, my students are seniors, but they're undergraduates now. But I want the, I want it to be somewhat publishable, at least in spirit. So, what am I looking at here? Well, what are the what are the the qualities? What are the the ingredients of a decent literature review? Well, and you think about let's see how how many. Uh, 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 pieces you know how many references do I want uh do I want them to organize it around a a conflict in in, in, between bodies of literature do I want them to uh organize it perhaps uh you know I don't know some some argument that is going on that in the in the on, on this particular topic uh, what are, you know, and it could be you know, literature reviews can take different forms, but you want to suggest forms to them because they're not familiar with literature reviews. Yeah, you can have them read some, but they're not as intimately familiar with literature reviews as we are because we write them, right? And we initially didn't know what was involved in a literature review either, which is why it was the last part we ever did. Of a, of a paper or of our dissertation. I know we wanted to start with that, but then we'd just go back and have to rewrite it. So anyway, um, so uh, what are other characteristics? Well, you might even want to tell students what you want in the first paragraph. You might want students in the, in the first paragraph to lay out, well, what's the conflict? What's the argument? 
Okay. What are the two sides? And then perhaps the second paragraph, you want to lay out one of the sides. Maybe the first two paragraphs, that's what you want to do. And then paragraphs four and five, you want to lay out the other side. Then after that, the, the, the uh, paragraph six, perhaps you want to say, okay, uh, we've had this apparent uh, controversy going on or apparent uh, conflict or paradox, whatever we want to call it, whatever it is. Uh, I'm going to, this is what I am doing in this paper that will help settle this argument. See, that's what a literature review is, right? But uh, you know what? We don't think about it in the abstract, do we? We really don't. Um, particularly the more literature reviews we've written, <laughs> the less we think about it, right? We just sort of, oh, yeah, I know how to write a literature review. Um, and we need to teach our students how to do this. And the way to teach them is say, these are the elements of a literature review. Most of the, most of, not all, but most of the assignments that we give to our undergraduates and even our graduate students follow a formula. They follow a template. And it's up to us to lay out that formula, to lay out that template. So students really will do a good job um, if they know what they're doing. Students love specs grading because they know what the expectations are. And you find out they, they, they you find out that most of them have been going through school not knowing what the expectations of an assignment are. And isn't that sad? Uh, I think it's I think it's really tragic, and so no wonder they 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 get they get grumpy over their grades because they thought the expectations were this given what you told them, but they but they were wrong. They're not mind readers, and so let's lay it out. And once we lay out those specs, now we got to stick by them. You know, right? That's just the moral thing to do. It's sort of like a one level rubric. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, but we're really looking at, at, at elements that must be there or a, the formula that, that students are to follow. Again, most of what we ask students to do are not creative. And if we do give them something creative to do, no problem. Specs grading can handle that as long as we lay out certain parameters. So let's say we're teaching a psychology course and uh, we want students to, let's say, uh, maybe the psychology of health or something like that. And so we want students to lay out, uh, to, let's say, do some public education. Okay. There are different ways to do public education, aren't there? So one, you say, Okay, what I want you to do, uh, one alternative for you to do this in this project is to do, uh, let's say, six, uh, 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 not brochures, but something like a brochure. It's like a pamphlet, pamphlet or um, uh, something like that, you know, with these fold out things where that's fine, the kind, uh, kind that you find in doctor's offices, perhaps, um you know, on maybe, you know, one on, on uh, having to do with, you know, sound eating and health and another thing having to do with exercise and health. And so, so do these little, do these pamphlets, so six pamphlets, and each pamphlet should be at least 200 words. All right, fine. Uh, or, or if you choose, uh, you can do a, a documentary film that is at least 20 minutes long and uh, that, you know, you, that has a script that you lay out in advance so you're not just winging it through there. Or perhaps, uh, you know what? You can write a song if you want to. You can do artwork if you want to. But it's just laying out the sort of like, the, in a sense, the, the bare minimum of the, the parameters of the form. But there are all different kinds of forms that, st that uh, students might be able to use to communicate the message. So that's how you would grade creative work. You're just setting out those parameters. Well, this is, uh, this is a great start to our conversation for specs grading uh, because I think that uh, people – 
I, I would love for people to read this book uh, bef- before they just kind of run with it. Because um, at the beginning, like a couple minutes ago, when you were talking about, you know, being clear, that might sound too prescriptive for people, but I'm glad you came up with this other example. It says, no, 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 no. it's not prescriptive. Like, uh, well, it, it is in some ways, but it, there's also, you can give students all kinds of choice, which is one of the big things yes. about it. But let's let's get there in, in, in a few minutes because one of the things that I think uh, specs grading challenges me with is uh, how transparent and clear am I with my students about how things are going to be graded and what the expectations are. If students don't know what the target is, it's a very frustrating experience to try to hit it. And um, and that's where, that's where specifications grading makes it um, in some ways, hard on faculty because it challenges that it holds up a mirror to say, are your assignments fair? Are you giving the criteria um, for for how you are going to grade these? So um, do, have I said anything wrong so far? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Okay, so because as I'm reading this, I'm yesterday we were driving, uh, I was on a road trip with my wife and, uh, and I was trying to explain this to her and she came up with all kinds of great questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, for, so I'm going to come up with some of those for you today, but, um, so, so clarity is, is clarity of our assignments allows us to, to have, um, not only higher expectations for students, but, um, but confidence that we are we we are teaching students i don't know with what ethics with integrity asking them to do what we want them to do yeah. um now now here's here's where i here's where i think there might be pushback and you say as much in the book okay so mm-hmm. um th- we want to know the the, re- the one of the problems that specs grading solves is that instead of giving these partial points for partial knowledge, they say, "Hey, students, you choose what you want to do, but you're going to be held to accountable and to account for whether you have reached this outcome." And it is a yes or no, right? Yep. yep. Um, e- exactly. And so, st- what you said about students starting to ask questions. Students understand that that work's going to get kicked back as a zero if they don't meet the specifications, so they better understand it. Um, yeah. So they there's all they, there's all kind of control that they have in choosing how to engage in the course, what 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 letter grade or whatever, what grade they're aiming for, or what track they're on. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we get to hold them accountable as well for what they've chosen. Is that right? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Okay, so that 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 threshold, whatever that threshold is for that outcome. Um, so maybe I give an assignment. Uh, so in my classes, I have them write a lot of applied questions, Psych 100, let's say. Um, I really want them to be able to apply psychological principles to everyday life or something like that. And um, and so there are students who do it in a mind blowingly awesome way, where I'm like, oh my goodness, this student is going to do so well in life. I can just tell by the quality of their work, the way they think about things. This is an a classic A student. And then I get answers that are where, the, yeah, the student gets it. It's great. Um, and then I get uh, this third kind of answer, which is, whoa, this student does not get what's going on. Um, so with specifications grading, I am setting that threshold of whether they get it or not. Be, and let's call those those examples that I just gave A, B, and C. Uh, let's call them okay. A, B, and D. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Sure. So there there is no difference then when when I put that threshold between uh, you know the the second and third student, um, the f- the first and second student who both get it, but one really exceedingly, mm-hmm. they earn the same. They earn the That's same. Right. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Okay, now, so tell got, me the why way, they that. Earn the same. Yeah, they go earn ahead. The same. The, the, they, uh, their uh, assignment passes. Okay, they both pass, and you know. But what you did on the A student one is you put a happy face on it. Okay, uh, you, in other words, right. You, you, nothing's stopping you from praising that student. A students are going to do a work, it doesn't matter what you do to them or what you don't do to them. They're going to do it. But if you, if you, 
just make them feel good about themselves. You know, forget about the numbers and the grades and all that. But you let them know that you thought well of their work. They'll 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 do anything for you. They'll they'll wash your windows, whatever. Because that's the way <laughs> A students are. Right. So uh, there's a couple. I know that there are a couple things that you have. Uh, I'll say criticisms or fears that faculty have, which is like, does spec will spec. Su- uh, grading, will my students learn as much? That's one question. And then secondly, will it inflate the grades? What do you think? Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk about that because that's always a fear. Um, we are always afraid that everybody will go for an A. And you know what? They won't. That's us. Okay. We'll always go for an A, won't we? But yep. other people will will not um okay I, I, there was before you were concerned about everybody going for an a they uh, inflating grades there was something else that you said before that oh boy i you know oh, okay. i i don't no. remember oh go maybe ahead. we'll stumble on it whatever yeah but, hopefully yeah. okay um you know, part, a, a part of specs grading is this idea of these bundles of assignment, as I mentioned before, bundles of assignments and tests, all of which, you know, if let's say you're going to go for the A bundle, you're going to have probably more work than the B bundle would or the C or the D, but whatever, or if you have Ds. But in any case, you, uh, there's, it's a matter of the, the amount of work. And usually also the difficulty of the work, the challenge of the work. So, you know, students are going to, you know, look at this rationally, knowing, by the way, that you will not hold it against them if they choose a C. Because they chose the C, that's all they needed. You don't care if they choose. I mean, you, you don't even know what they're choosing, right? But if they wind up with a C, you can respect that. That probably was what they were going for. So it's not like they they needed anything else, uh, and or they were trying to you know they, they had no reason particularly to impress you, uh, and so you know we we accept that. Now, when you start getting into uh, upper division classes in the major, yeah, you're going to have almost everyone, not necessarily everyone, but almost everyone going for an A. Well, guess what? Those classes tend to have higher grades anyway. So I don't think our grades are going to be any higher than they have been anyway, uh, especially when we get into courses in the major. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, so we're used to doing this. Uh, when you're looking more like introductory courses and anything, if anything, we should be encouraging our disadvantaged students to go for that A, because they might not have the the self esteem to aim high, so we need we'll need to encourage some of our students to go for the A, um, and at least you know, will they get it? No, but you know if they were thinking necessarily they might get it, but not necessarily that what they were thinking of that. Well, I'm you know I'm a C student, I'll go for a C. Uh, and no, 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 no. Go for something higher. Challenge yourself. If you don't get an A, that's not a problem. Maybe you'll get a B, which you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Right. Yeah. So as I'm reading this book, I can't help but think about how it applies to my courses. I'm going to do it. I don't, uh, at some point in the next year, my courses will uh, at least integrate some amount of specs grading. And I know that you go into your book, I think in the last couple chapters about kind of different models, ways of, uh, of, of using specs grading as kind of infusing with traditional grading. But I just want to talk about running a specs grading course. Yes. Um, because so what people need to understand is that every assignment that you have can be, and and you call them uh, you call them methods and um, what is the other word that you call you call um, anyway? I'm trying to pick up the the vocabulary that you uh-huh. use in the book. But for every uh, every uh, assignment that you have, it can be, and I don't mean this in a bad way. It can be reduced down to the 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 specific criteria that a student needs to display in order to pass. Yes. Um, 
And that can be done on every level. Now, um, for for people who are thinking, well, how does this actually look? I love the examples you give mid book. You give all these examples um, mm-hmm. and 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 charts and tables of people who have done it. And so yes. I just want people to think about it this way. Um, you could do it as a grid where um, it says students who earn a C do these things. And then it's check boxes down and students who do uh, who earn B is, and they do these things. And then there's check different check boxes and some the same. The, the best way I think to explain it is to say students who, who earn uh, who earn a, you know, uh, a C do this students who earn a B do all of the C things yes. plus this mm-hmm. students who do uh, earn an A do all of the B and C things. Um, now I love this metaphor that you use of hurdles. It really spoke to yes. me because oh, stu- instructors have to ask themselves, um, what does this look like in my course? And what it looks like is either more assignments or, or um, what, what would you call a higher more, hurdle? More you challenging. Call like, more challenging. More, ch- more challenging. Level. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you could th- think of, think of uh, you know, the student track as, you know, a literal track and field. And um, you could either, to make it more, more difficult, you can either put more hurdles in or you can raise the height of the hurdles. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So I was thinking to myself, it didn't hit me till this morning. Um, I, most of my uh, Psych 100 um assignments are written assignments applied questions again uh, uh, uh psychological principles applied to life uh-huh. and uh, let's say that i give students 10 questions a week um i could f- i i you know i'm on a 10 week quarter so i i kind of figured well that's nice i could have you know it to earn an a in this course you do uh eight you know, eight of these, um, 10 and you do them to an acceptable, uh, level, something like that. But then I thought to myself, well, how do I, how do I raise the bar, uh, with students? And then I thought about it. Um, not all of these 10 questions are equal. Uh, you talked about Bloom's taxonomy in the first couple chapters of your book. Some of them are really the students just explaining the concept. And some of the questions are students really applying the concept and at that point, I can start to distinguish w- different levels of achievement for my students. What do you think about that? Ah, okay. Okay. Now, are you talking about, though, giving grades to the assignments? Or are you talking about saying, okay, if you're going to go for a B, your questions must be application questions. Or for a C, let's say they have to be explanation questions. Okay. For a, a well, B, applied question. For A, e, I don't know, evaluation questions. Okay. So, I'm in the th- – this is going to get a little bit into the weeds here. But okay. on these on these, <laughs> these assignments – uh, if you turn it in, you're turning in all 10 questions and they are of different varying levels. But here's what I could tell you. I sample grade. So I don't grade all 10 questions. Okay. I sample grade. But I was thinking students could choose to be on the uh, kind of the the lower hurdle grading path where I choose different questions to grade. Now, they don't know which ones I'm going to grade. But if they identify, yes, I'm on the lower uh, hurdle here, um, mm-hmm. then I would choose kind of lower blooms um uh, questions to grade and if they were on saying i'm identifying on the higher level then i would grade the more challenging question ah but see that's assuming that you know in advance what your students are going for well i would have them identify it ah okay okay because in specs grading that isn't necessary i mean if you want okay i mean if you if you want to ask them and they tell you that's fine it, I mean, well and that's the contract part that you were saying is a little bit yeah. different right okay yes. okay okay yeah and and you know and that that's that's okay uh but uh that's not uh, with specs grading students wind up with what they wind up with Okay, good. Well, okay, so let me clarify something then. I understand how to add more more assignments, so more hurdles, so that students who are doing an A are doing more things. Can you talk to me a little bit more about raising the bar? Okay, okay. But in terms of the level of challenge, uh, you know, you were talking before that the the easiest way of thinking of this is like, 
uh, you do such and such for a C, and for a B, you do whatever you did for a C and something else or more of something. And then for an A, what you do for you know, B and a C, and, and then you add something to it. That is the easiest and cleanest way to build in challenge uh, in these bundles. And uh, what you, for, 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 you know, the basic things that everybody should be doing to pass the course should be at, yeah, a relatively low challenge level. Uh, and, but for a B, they can stay at that low challenge level on these like more or less routine assignments, but then they have to do something in addition to that, 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 that demonstrates higher level thinking. And then for an A, they have to do something more challenging still than what the B person has to, what the B bundle requires students to do. So that's the easiest way to think of it. Um, by the way, that makes a whole lot of sense. And when I was reading through the examples you gave, I thought uh-huh. one of the things I thought from, uh, and you, you you provide examples from people's syllabi, yes, um, or and from their assignments. And I thought the this is so clear. Like the examples you give, uh-huh. my students, my students need that um, because it it's just. Once it's in front of them in a table form or in bullet points, which are some of the examples you give in the book, students read those and it's like, oh, that's what I do for a B or that's what I do for an A. It really can be that simple. Um, yeah. And I think that, that this is a trap that a lot of faculty fall into is uh, there, there is, uh, there's just a lack of clarity. Yes. Yes, and it gets gets confusing, especially like I've seen syllabi where like you know we'll, you know there's six hundred points or six thousand points or whatever in the course, and then there's this breakdown as to you know what eventually will constitute an A and my points points are just points are death. I mean, they really are. They get us into trouble. They get our students into trouble. They make our students nags. Um, they are, uh, you know, anybody who's even vaguely arithmetically challenged, you know, uh, students don't know what grade, you know, students will always come and you say, well, I don't know what grade I'm getting. Well, go look in the grade book in the learning management system. Well, I don't follow that. And they really, right. people have trouble with it. Uh, and it's, you know, the only way that we keep track of it is we use a computer, Right, we scattered right. that up in advance, and well, we if we just looked at this as discrete things for students to do and to do right, okay, because we've laid out those specs, um, then things become so much simpler. And when we're right, at- so so your grade book, then I'm sorry to interrupt, um, uh, but I just have a quick question. So the grade book then looks like check boxes, like satisfying, right. yeah, satisfying the 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 specifications. That's right. That's right. It's sort of you can turn it into a zero one system if you want to, whatever. But you, I mean, you can do it because I know people who have whatever LMS where they're using, they have, uh, you know, they've modified their use of the grade book and, you know, done a lot of zero one, zero one stuff. Um, but, you know, ultimately you've got to, you know, th- think about how you're going to adapt the grade book. But then, a couple of people I know, they don't even use the grade book anymore because this is so simple um, that they don't need to. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm trying to think uh, for the listener who has never heard of specs grading, uh, what have we covered so far? Okay. We've, we've covered that. Get- yeah, go ahead. Three elements, three important elements of specs grading. One, all... Uh, uh, assignments and tests are graded pass fail, but at a higher level than we think of as pass. So 80% with tests, uh, and with respect to assignments, what we want to do, you know, if we've been grading assignments using a rubric, uh, just look at the top two levels of the rubric 
and elaborate on those enough that your students to actually know what you're talking about. Okay. And those, but that might be a good way to start uh, because we're making them stretch. We're going to make them stretch, but we're going to tell them exactly how to stretch and how far to stretch and what it feels like. Okay. Uh, the second end, second chances, I call them tokens and people call them Hail Marys. And people have all kinds of names for them, but Students start out the semester with so many of these tokens or get out of jail free cards. I like that one too. Um, and what they are, they are, they are second chances, but they're also a lot of some flexibility to the system. So let's say you, if you fail, if one of your, your, your tests or uh, assignments fail, you can do it over again. Now, there are a discrete number of these things, so you can't just do this again and again and again. Uh, another thing uh, that you can use this for is uh, like a makeup exam, for instance, or uh, a, a 24-hour extension. Because uh, late work doesn't late work doesn't fit in well with specs grading. It ought to be there on time. All right. And so you can build in on time as one of the specs. I mean, that's up to you. Um, you, you are the master of this economy. But in any case, usually people decide to give their students three tokens in a semester or a, a quarter. You're on a quarter system. Uh, some people I've seen as many as five. Uh, but I do believe in giving at least three. Uh, because the students, initially, students aren't going to believe you, that you would, well, you can't fail me. You don't fail anybody. Well, that's that, then they'll find out on the first assignment that, oops, it can happen. And it just happened to me. Okay. And that's the raising the, raising the rigor piece, right? You when you are, And you're motivating students to take interest because maybe some of them have never failed before. And you say, no, you failed. Here, you can use a token now. And mm-hmm. and really quickly they get it and do it again exactly and they be oh and then they, it yeah. really dawns on them yeah like yeah oh no partial credit like you mean I have to do it right the first time yes that's exactly what you have to do yes. you got to do it right the first time so <laughs> number one all assignments pass fail number two second chances or get out of jail free or whatever uh, yeah. number three. Uh, the bundles the associated with grades and not only associated with grades, but also associated. You can do this if you want. You don't have to, but uh, associated with outcomes. So a grade actually is associated with a list of outcomes that the students have achieved. And so at that, you know, it's funny. Accrediting agencies just laugh at our grades, right? And for good reason, because what does it mean to get a C in the class? Is that in terms of outcomes? Does that mean that you've sort of met, kind of met all of them? Or you've met maybe only two out of 20? Or what What does it mean? What does a B mean? Does an A even mean that you've, you've uh, achieved all the outcomes? Well, not necessarily, right? So it doesn't mean anything. With, with, with specs grading, you can, if you want, you can make it mean those grades mean something in terms of the outcomes that have been achieved. And that can be laid out. In fact, you could put this in your syllabus. If you go for an A and wind up with an A, you will have achieved these outcomes. You will be able to do these things. If you go for a B, you'll only be able to do these things. But that's pretty good. Now, if you go for a C, just, you know, the, now, if you've got a professional, uh, type of crediting agency that says, well, in order to, uh, uh, you know, go, go through this program and to be considered, to pass through this program, uh, your students have to be able to do X, Y, Z, all these different things by the end of the program or by the end of your course, then you have to make all those required for a C. For whatever or whatever you consider passing, because uh, you know, and then and then the the B and the A, you're doing additional things. There is no reason in the world why your students, why all your students, can't achieve the outcomes that your uh, accrediting agency sets out. 
There is no reason in the world. None of them are outrageous outcomes. None of them. But students do have to apply themselves. They have to be motivated to care because otherwise they can just slip on through with uh, partial credit and a lot less work. Well, I I love that your book starts with outlining the problem. And this this is one of the things you talk about. You talk about accreditation and you also talk about um, and the teaching of psychology uh, folks love, love, love talking about kind of relevant education and skills-based education and what are we act, how are we actually preparing students for the workforce? And you talk a lot about that um, because there is this disconnect between how students are coming out of college and their performance um, at their jobs. And so you talk about this in terms of authentic assessment, and this is where specs grading works really nicely because uh, these are, uh, these are in some, in some cases skills like, you've developed this skill or you haven't as an outcome. Um, yes. Do you want to say anything about that? Yes. It's, it, it reminds me of competency-based education. Uh, although those are, you know, those are programs, right? Uh, and you can, uh, you know, you could go through multiple assessments on the same outcomes if you haven't reached them. Uh, and then you go through another you go through another round. Uh, you can't just do this forever, right? But uh, there, there's some flexibility there. Where if at first you don't succeed, you try, try again. Well, of course, we're dealing with a course, and we're dealing with within a um, you know a, a structure, an, a, a, a higher education structure where we have these semesters or these these trimesters or whatever you want to call them. So we just can't. You say, well, you're coming into this program. It may take you two years. It may take you four years. It may take you six. Hey, we don't care. We do care. Okay, we really do care. Um, So anyway, so we just can't go willy-nilly, just like take your time. So, but it is like a competency-based education, which is based on the way competencies have to do with outcomes. Can you do these things or not? And when you say, can you do them or not? You've got to specify the level that you want to see your students doing these things at. Uh, There are low levels, there are high levels, but what we, what we have something in mind when we ask our students to be able to like write a literature review, right? We have something in mind, a certain level in mind that is realistic, but a higher level than what we're getting now. Um, you know, except from our A students, maybe, uh, and they pretty much psyched out the system, and they they they're they're used to reading their teachers' minds, but most most students are not used to doing that, and most students don't put in as much work as they need to do uh, need to put in to get to really do rigorous work. Right. Yes. And um, the, the, one of the other things, and, and I, I know I've, I've kept you a little bit over time, but I just want to ask uh, it's okay. one more one more question. But um, the one of the things that, that you really go into depth about in one of your chapters is how specs grading motivates students. So I'd, I'd definitely say to listeners, go read the book, um, read the literature about student motivation, the theories behind specs grading. Um, and then, but but here's one I, I'd love you to comment on before we uh, before we part today, um, which is how does specs grading um, how does it serve faculty? And and I know that one of the things, and maybe this is what we can talk about, is saving time, and that's the claim. Yes. Um, but can you just talk about how does this serve me as a faculty uh, member, uh, just with my kind of my my term long or even or daily tasks? Okay. Uh, one the, the the main thing is that that saving time part. There there are two ways in which it saves time. Uh, it's just in the general grading process. You 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 know you look through a paper. Let's say it's a paper. Uh, you look through it. You look to see that you've got the specs on your other hand, and you look to see if there are any specs missing. Now you might get so intrigued with what the student's writing that you know. You just get intrigued with it. But you know what? You can do that because you're not sitting with a red pencil trying to correct anything you see that's wrong. And that's where we, 
that's where we, that's one reason why we hate grading. We're not even getting the message that our students are trying to convey to us. So it saves us time in the way that all we have to worry about are the students meeting the specs. If they don't meet a spec, we let them know they didn't meet it. Otherwise, they passed. Everything's cool. Okay. And if we want to write any comments at the end, we are more than welcome to do so. But we don't absolutely have to. All right. So that's it. So another way it saves us time is we don't have that parade of students uh, outside our door the next day and the day after or an email complaining about their grades. We just don't. Students don't complain. When you say, I didn't, you didn't meet this particular uh, spec, you didn't satisfy it, students tend to realize that they didn't. They don't wind up arguing with you about it. Uh, it's it's just not something that, that they do. And they realize, you know, I overlooked that or I thought maybe I could get away with it. As long as we're clear. So it's saving. And that also saves us stress. And because, you know, I mean, we, we want to love our students. And all these these grade complaints and protests, all that gets in the way. It gets in the way of our relationship with our students. So, you know, so that's another way in which it saves us, you know, saves stress. But the, the time factors uh, are just, you know, the on the day-to-day thing, that practical day-to-day thing has to do with the actual grading and has to do with the um, the, the fallout after we, we give back our work. Yeah, and I I really loved the uh, the teacher voices that you included in the book because I so often resonated with the quotes you included, uh, specifically around this. Um, I, I just have memories of, of reading this and uh, and when when a teacher is talking about just the pain just yeah. the pain of being between like do i give the the do i give the um the partial point here or not oh. um and i mean that that is that's a terrible and and so costly and oh, yeah. um well and then and then specs grading it uh one of the things i think that is painful in those moments is uh, I think maybe exposed by inter-rater reliability, which is if I came back to this again, uh, would I do the same thing or would somebody else give the same grade that I'm choosing? Whereas with specs grading, it's much more clear cut. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of freeing that way. Yes. Yes, it is. It is freeing. And it you get a uh, higher inter, uh, inter-rater reliability as well because it's it's there or it isn't. Yeah, it's there. It isn't, uh, and yeah. that's a lot easier to decide than the ex- the quality at which it is there or not there. You know, is it there a little bit? If it's there a little bit, well, we want to give them benefit of the doubt to our students. You know, that's fine. Right. I mean, they're yeah. not meeting that outcome that we had in mind. Yeah. Well, uh, to those out there who are interested in trying this, I promise you, it's going to be a ton of work up front because you're going to clarify. Uh, you're going to clarify uh, every part of your assignments in a way that students can better understand it, but it will pay off in the end. Is that safe to say? Yes, it actually will. And because I've never, ever, ever known a faculty member to go back to tr- traditional grading after they've done specs grading. Never. And uh, they love it. Students love it. Oh, Lord, there's there's nothing like making students feel secure with expectations and they love you for it. So, yeah. Well, uh, thanks for that. I, I hope that you'll all check out uh, Linda's work um, and uh, you can find her website at lindanilson.com. And uh, Linda, again, thanks so much. And, and thanks for uh, your contribution uh, to teaching and, and what we're doing here in higher education. Garth, it's really been a pleasure, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about this, and I love to spread the word. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.